Hello, everyone. Go ahead, take a seat. <laughs> so glad that you are all joining us tonight. This is the fourth annual Racial Monologues, and we are currently on our world tour. <laughs> we, have been, yeah. <laughs> we have been at the Venice uh, UU, we've been at the Punta Gorda Civic Association, and now we are with you tonight, and we'll be somewhere else. I'll tell you about that at the end. Would you all please check that your phones are in airplane mode, or tonight we'll call it racial monologues mode? So my name is Samara Michelson, and I directed the Racial Monologues, and I've been in co-production with Ginger and Kay. And all the stories that you're gonna to hear tonight have never been told out loud before, except at the other parts of our tour. And so it's all new material, even if you've seen the Racial Monologues before. All the stories are submitted anonymously, so keep in mind as you're listening that it's not the person reading the story who wrote it. In fact, you will know that if it's your story that's being read at that moment. <laughs> I see that you know, there's some faces of people who wrote our stories. And we try to get these stories by talking to people we know, and um, I know that I went to a few people at a meeting and just wrote down their stories because the process of writing seemed intimidating. Um, so the stories have been gathered in different ways from as diverse a group as we could encounter in our lives. This year, we're especially inspired by Ruth King's book, Mindful of Race. Is anyone familiar with that book, Mindful of Race? She's a meditation teacher, an international meditation teacher, and she's talking about how important it is, no matter what your race is, to have this way of working with your nervous system and being in your own wellness, and only from that place can you come out to transform the world. She says, Ruth King says, the world's heart is on fire, and race is at its core. The bitter racial seeds from past beliefs and actions are blooming all around us, reflecting not only a division of the races that is rooted in ignorance and hate, but also, and more sorely, a division of heart. Racism is a heart disease. Many of us can live for a while with a heart disease without even knowing it. And other of us, others of us, know we have a heart disease, but are afraid or even in denial about it. But racism is a heart disease and it's curable. May our stories be part of the cure. And as our very fancy vocal warm up, we're just gonna take a second to all share our names. If you all stand up. Lionel. Kay. Steven. Lori. Marlena. Sushila. Sharon. Samara. Ginger. I am a black woman. I am a black man. I am an Indian woman. I am a white woman. I am a white man. May I work with my thoughts, fears, and beliefs in ways that nurture the dignity of all races. May we embrace our membership in each other's lives to discover our wholeness. May I welcome discomfort as a wake-up call to transform my heart and heal the heart of the world. Microaggression, noun. Everyday verbal, nonverbal, and environmental slight or insult, intentional or not. I don't see color, you say. 
all are brimmed with goodwill and intentions. Yes, you do, I want to respond. Haven't you praised my blue blouse, noted how green the grass after the rain? I understand that you use the cliche to declare lack of bias, which makes me suspect that unless you are blind, the shades you allege not to see only range from black to light brown. I don't see color, you say. Do you know why I flinch? Know why, however well meant, the statement offends? What you intend misses the point. What matters is what it conveys about you, about me. Consider this. I want you to see my color. I want you to see that it speaks of a cultural, ancestral richness of art, music, and dance. That it signals my history from ancient <coughs> traditions to Black Lives Matter. That it glows in my skin from the top of my head to the tops of my feet. The skin that protects and preserves me from youth through old age. See my color. I wear it with pride. Say to me, I see your color, and it's beautiful. I remember the time several summers ago when my daughter brought her black boyfriend to the cabin, and the two of them went out on the lake in the pontoon boat. For the first time in our 40-year tenure on the lake, a family member was not only stopped, but given a $150 ticket for driving a boat they couldn't, when they couldn't produce the registration. Is this a coincidence? Maybe. Maybe not. My mind on a roll, I recall the gigantic Confederate flag just off to the side of the road on the way into our town from the cabin in the heart of this northern Wisconsin vacation land. Behind a mass of pine trees and surrounded by an army of beaten up trucks, it's easy to miss. My sister had told me about it the previous summer, but this year is the first time I saw it myself. The sight makes my stomach turn. A blight on the pristine landscape in this place so special to me and my family. This isn't even the South. Don't they know what side Wisconsin was on during the Civil War? <laughs> My interest in Confederate flags started a few years ago when I moved to Florida and saw them frequently, usually on pickup trucks and motorcycles when I was stopped at red lights. In disbelief at first, I actually Googled to make sure that they were actually Confederate flags. I was amazed that people in this day and age proudly displayed them. What are they thinking? What do they want people to think about them, and why? I consider myself a patriot. However, the Trump years and the rise of open white supremacy have robbed me of the joy of it. When I see the American flag prostituted like those racists did in Charlottesville, I react viscerally. I deny the right to wave the flag to those who want to claim the country for only the white, the male, and the privileged. How did we get here, and how do we get out? One day, my printer called and said a woman needed a book published in Toronto. That's what I do. So I said, show and call the woman. We agreed to meet at the IHOP. We both wear red. A black man in a red shirt. I told her she can't miss me. Soon enough, the car pulled up. and A woman in a red blouse got out. I walked up to her, and she looked surprised. I asked her if she was the person I had been waiting for. She looked flustered and said no. I went back to my car, dumb enough to think, to, to feel embarrassed. I had approached the wrong person. A few minutes later, she came out of the restaurant, got in her car without looking my way, and drove away. 
I never heard from the woman who needed a book published. I love to travel. Anything less than three hours in an away from home airport is a pleasant adventure. It's a chance to taste new coffees, look at gadgets, and get a sense of a different city. In January of 2020, I had a layover in the Charlotte Airport in North Carolina, pausing in the deep south before I headed to a conference in Seattle. The Charlotte Airport was quiet and I was crossing ground quickly, my carry-on rolling behind me as I took in all this place had to offer. Porch rockers, a sign for a major airport overhaul, currency exchange, Walking toward my gate, I heard credit card mileage offers and smiled, shaking my head. But when an older African-American man called out to me offering a shoe shine, I paused, addressed him as sir, and thanked him, declined, and moved on. I couldn't bear the thought of this silver-haired black elder bent over a white woman's boots as she sat on an elevated throne-like chair. Rationally, I know that this man was making money at his job, but scenes from old movies that glorified picturesque servitude had started rolling in my head. I said no thank you. I said no thank you to his making money because of a conflict that's still rattling around in my brain. I respect his work ethic and his job, and I know that I hurt him financially because of privilege that allowed me to say no, walk away, and get on a plane. I wonder if he's still shining shoes and what I'll do the next time I'm in Charlotte. I was doing my morning walk at 7.30 in my poor child neighborhood. And this middle-aged white man, white guy, excuse me, wearing a camouflage hat and jacket, rides by on his, on his bicycle. He shouts out at me, neighborhood trash. He keeps going, and I think to myself, he's such a coward. Why did he get off his bike and confront me? Then we could have had a dialogue about his feelings towards me being a black person. I didn't think more about it as I continued walking because I didn't want it to spoil. I didn't want my spirit to be that disturbed. Visiting home, a poem. Sunday drives, Sunday dinners, Chicken and biscuits, Aunt Hannah's gravy. The old rhythms of life lurch, then take hold. Like an old car, stick shift, foot on the clutch. The gears slide into a remembered place. This is Faulkner's country, where once an octoroon in the family ancestry was more shameful than incest where every drop of one's blood must run pure and white, where separate but equal was the law, separate bathrooms, separate water fountains, separate schools, but never, never equal. We are a defeated people, twice forced by federal armed troops to change our ways, and so, we cherish our heat, our magnolia blossoms, sweet tea ceiling fans, front porch swings, our guns, our Confederate flag. Or we say, as my brother did, I hate the South. I hate the South. I hate the South. On intersectionality. All stood as requested. 
but ask to sit down at the first unrecognized name. Laquan McDonald, Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, all remained standing. Knew these were people of color killed by police. Philando Castile, Terrence Crutcher, some people sat down. Miriam Carey, Eleanor Bumpers, almost all seated now. Rekia Boyd, Katherine Johnson, Kendra James, all of us back in our chairs. Whose names were those last? They too are people of color, shot by police, except they were women. Overlooked, undervalued, mislaid. No such headlines for Rekia, Catherine, Kendra, as for Eric, Eric, Michael, Trevon, showing how bigotry and misogyny intersect at the corner where gender meets race. Sandra Bland, also a woman, and black spoke up for her rights. Unlike the former, is fairly well known by dint of identity markers, education, economics, and class. Not enough an advantage to save her or to trump her gender and race, just a place in the hall of shame. is to be cheerful and to talk to everyone. You know how I am, right? Last week I passed an elderly white man. Good morning, sir. How are you today? He stopped and said, <coughs> We don't want your kind here, he said. to put into words why I can't stand it when everyone at the beach is white. I'm white too, just makes my throat constrict. I don't know how to put into words why I want to leave when everyone at a restaurant is white. I'm white too, it makes the skin on my neck crawl. I don't know how to put into words why I feel angry when everyone at a concert, at a festival, on a dance floor is white. I am white too. It makes my stomach tighten. I don't know how to put into words why I feel hopeless. When I look at a glossy retreat center catalog and everyone is white, I am white too. It makes my feet I just know when I'm walking at the Martin Luther King Parade and following a whole truck of retired black teachers who are singing a song they made up for their students, I'm prancing around with glee. I just know that when I'm landing at the airport in New York City, step into a big crowd of every hue, I'm grinning ear to ear. A big sigh of relief passes through me. I just know that every day I experience a deep longing to be in the company of a diverse community of loved ones. <laughs> Laughing our joy, suffering together, being real. I'm a passionate shade of white and I love all the other hues I see. sit around the Thanksgiving table and share the gratitude for a close-knit family with my biracial son-in-law's black family. 
That may be an unobtainable goal and vision. I currently believe myself to be naive in expecting to be part of my son-in-law's family. It will never be possible for me to be part black. There is a minimal difference in our dermal chemistry, yet a huge experiential gap of being black isolates us. Our culture has trained me and bred me to be too different. I might be too different personally for me to be accepted by in-laws who share white ethnicity. It may be a gulf of my own creation, but it has profoundly affected my failure to feel the bond I would love to have with my family. I will still do all I can to share life experiences with Livingston and Willow. I hope that the New York family branch will accept our mixed race progeny with open hearts. It is a moment I will never forget. I had only been living in Southwest Florida for two weeks and was heading into a public elementary school for an interview as a second grade teacher. As I entered the building, I glanced through the narrow glass panel in the door and there it was. A full size Confederate flag hanging in the lobby. Immediately two thoughts raced through my brain. First, where the hell am I? Next, should I turn around and run back to my car? I took a deep breath and decided to continue on into the lobby. As I looked around, I saw student work relating to the Civil War hanging on the walls and on display in the glass cases. It was the fifth grade's turn to share what they had been learning. I assumed that some student had volunteered to bring in this prized possession of their family, and for some reason, the teachers had thought it was a good idea to hang it prominently in the lobby. It never even occurred to them what kind of first impression this might give or how the African-American families attending the school might feel as they viewed this symbol of hate and racism as they entered the school each day. I decided to go ahead with the interview and really liked the principal. She apparently liked me too, because I was hired. It was a couple of years before, it was a couple of years before I shared this uh, with her, the story of my initial impression of the school and how close I had came to ditching the interview. She had an aha moment and asked me to share the story at a faculty meeting. Other than scattered um, nervous laughter, I don't recall a single response from any of my colleagues. I spent 20 years at that school and was the only African American teacher there the entire time. There were two black teacher's aides and custodians on and off during that 20 year period and I was often the only person of color on the entire staff. In the last five years, I was joined by a teacher who is, eight, who is Chinese. I learned through the grapevine that the two of us were the teachers most often named when parents were requesting a teacher they did not want for their child. Many people want to believe that we live in a post-racial society. That's sure not my experience in our schools where our children are learning about the real world. A poem for all you beautiful women. Inauguration day, January 20th, 2009. For you, Dell, arriving each morning in the back of the Dell bus, and you, Larisa, ironing our shirts. For you, Maggie, who wanted to be a seamstress, but spent your days 
cleaning our house instead. This day is for you. For you, Odessa, with your play daughter, cooking fried chicken, biscuits, and buttery pound cakes in our kitchen. For Jeannie, helping me with my newborn son. And Musette, playing board games with my kids while I work. If I can marry Musette, if I can't marry Mommy, I'll marry Musette. <laughs> For you, Eileen, for all those years you wiped their noses and soothed their chicken pox. This day is for you. For Mildred, my IBM friend, who introduced me to Pascal's. And you, Lillian and Vita, in your colorful silks. Lillian, who said not a day goes by she's not reminded she's black. For your dignity, for your courage, your hard work, day after day, for your cheerfulness, for you this day, for you, a young black man like yourselves, takes Lincoln's Bible, raises his hand, and lifts you up, all of you, on whose shoulders he stands. Because of you, he can see all the way to the Washington Monument and beyond. Because of you, your faith, your hope, your willingness to do and do again, he stands here today in this cold, bright sunlight. And you, like him, can see the million faces like yours expectant and free at last. Oh, you beautiful women, this day is for you. Please don't call me African American. Why do white Americans still get to be called white or simply American? Is it because they're considered too diverse for us to presume their heritage belongs to two continents only? Or is it because America is, first and foremost, their land of opportunity? Most of the brown and black skinned people stuffed in a box labeled African Americans <coughs> have never even been to, to Africa. So why segregate them into a separate American box? While European descended whites enjoy the privilege of American, no qualifier ever needed, their non-white fellow Americans get filed under African American, Asian American, Native American, and Latino. <coughs> so the next time anyone is, is describing me and they have no idea where I was born, they can skip the political correctness. Black is as beautiful as ever, and if they must stick a label on me based on the color of my skin, which is actually closer to chocolate, I haven't heard a better one yet. Please, don't, don't call, call me African American. This is the voices of eight different white women who were talked to in the streets. White woman number one. I used to take my young white son and a black friend of his on Saturday outings to parks, museums, lunch. After a while, it dawned on me that the servers, museum and program assistants, always served the little white boy first. This even happened when the person serving was black. I tried to prevent it and offset it by building up the black boy's confidence in other ways. I probably wasn't successful. A black nanny started talking to me in the park one day. I was shocked. No black woman had ever talked to me in the park where I live. My black cleaning lady was recommended to me by two friends who said she was wonderful. Then they got mad at me for paying her a decent wage and social security and vacation time just because they wanted to keep her wages low. 
And these were rich women who were feminists, fighting for equal pay, maternity leave, all that. I met a black woman once. She was nice. <laughs> <laughs> My husband wanted to live in a mixed race neighborhood. But I hated this, hated living there because there was no one for my kids to play with. All the kids were black. I love to walk in the alleys in the city I live in up north. You can see gardens, jungle gyms, interesting st structures and sandboxes, beautiful trees. But I always realize that if I weren't white, I couldn't do this because people would be calling the police. I was pushing my two-year-old in a stroller one day when a black homeless man came up to us and said, hmm, I bet he's got a bank account already, doesn't he? I was using a communal swimming pool at a friend's con con uh, condominium in Fort Lauderdale last month. Two black teenage girls came in with their key, but a white woman questioned them about what unit they came from. When I asked her why she hadn't questioned me, she didn't answer. I grew up on the East Coast in a comfortably integrated section of a major city. My elementary, junior high, and high schools were racially mixed, although there were very few teachers of color. Hispanics didn't exist in the area, and the other minority groups were Jewish, Italian, and Polish. Think 1950s, 1960s. In junior high school, <clears throat> I was invited to a dance at the YWCA held by African American parents for their children. I knew everyone there, but no one asked me to dance. After an hour, it occurred to me that I was the only dark brown skinned attendee. Different treatment by my own kind, based on my skin color, was really a low blow. I told my very fair-skinned, blonde, green-eyed mother what had happened. She acknowledged color consciousness among our people and had rebelled against it as a teenager and young adult by dating only darker brown-skinned men, hence my brown complexion. I encountered this again at my historically black university. Being browner than a paper bag and not having a 4.0 grade point average meant I couldn't pledge for a certain sorority. Most of my working career was spent in federal service starting in 1972. I had the distinction of being the first female or racial minority in every position I held in my 25 years of service. It was a matter of timing following the civil rights initiatives of the 1960s. More than once, I have been mistaken for the help rather than being the keynote speaker. It wasn't my dress, but my color. I relish their embarrassment, I admit. <laughs> <laughs> There's 12 of us, 12, 12 of us who go out to eat whenever it's one of our birthdays. Our friend picked the Peace River seafood, and we were the only black people there like we always are. When we finished our meal, and were walking out, there was a whole lot of people waiting to come in. We heard one guy say to another, where did they come from? His friend answers, look at that. They just keep coming. When will it stop? There must have been a bus that dropped them off. My friend said, yes, we will keep coming. We are out in the parking lot and we all look at each other. A bus? Do you see a bus out there? Yeah. We've got our Mercedes, our Lexus, but there is no bus. A bus? Come on now. <laughs> this is America, you know. A loud male voice ripe with fury rings out. The anger is enough to startle me. I turn to see what the commotion is about, not realizing the disturbance has to do with my nephews, with me, with us. 
I'm a little frightened. My sister Mary, her two sons, and I have stopped in a small town in northwest Wisconsin where we plan to eat lunch on our way to our family vacation home. My two nephews, Marco, a recent high school graduate, and Antonio, a sophomore in college, and I are looking for a restaurant while Mary takes the dog to do her business. I've been walking down the street at a fast pace and the teenagers are lagging behind. I turn around to see what's going on and, on and I realize what I hadn't noticed before. American flags hung from star storefronts on both sides of the town's historic main street. In full 4th of July glory, I spot an irate older white man with a big <coughs> beer belly dressed in patriotic gear. We make eye contact and he glowers with defiance. The three of us are the only ones besides this old white guy in the street, already deserted for the holidays. Is he angry with us? What was all that about, I asked my nephews as they catch up with me. Antonio was just saying, boy, this town really loves American flags. Mark, Marco replies, oh my God. That guy's a racist, I say emphatically, looking over my shoulder. No way, Antonio chimes in. Why would you think that? Because he's so angry, I answer. Maybe he thinks you two are from another country. Well, maybe Antonio, says Marco. He's a lot darker than me. <laughs> I still don't think he was being racist, Antonio scowls. These kids are products of my Nordic-looking sister, who is as pale as it gets, and her husband, Chris a native African of East Indian heritage. Chris is as dark as my sister is light. And their two boys are both striking, a true blend of their two ethnicities. I am perplexed until I realize I am in a part of the country where you seldom, if ever, see people of color. I hadn't even <coughs> thought about that until this moment. Is that my, why not? Is it my ob oblivious white privilege rearing its ugly head? Are my nephew's de denials obvious to me, but not to them? A product of their own privileged upbringing. Later, I ask my sister what she thinks. She tells me that she worries about her boys, like many other mothers and fathers of brown and black sons. She's concerned that they are clueless about their differences. Mary tells me she's had to have the talk with each of her sons about what to do if stopped by the police. She worries about them still not understanding that they could be treated with bigotry, violence, and suspicion. She may be right to be worried. They were raised in an elite, diverse community insulated from such contempt. They excelled in private schools and were the apples of many eyes. Marco is an outstanding athlete. Antonio, a technology whiz who graduated from college in three years. For the first time ever, I realized my sister Mary has fears that have never occurred to me. Fears we've never talked about. I am struck by my ignorance. I met Dave in about 1965, working at the American Shipbuilding Company located on the Black River in Lorain, Ohio. We both left shipbuilding about the same time and started working as boilermakers. Um, Boilermakers build pressure vesicle, vessels, and it's hard, dirty, and dangerous work. Dave and I became good friends, working side by side many times during the more than 30 years we were members of the union together. We had to depend on one another to do dangerous jobs, things that bring men together. After retiring, we both took up sailing, open ocean sailing, and sailing for fun. I was visiting Dave three years ago 
And as we walked up the driveway discussing social problems, he told me this story. Dave's father owned a one-man auto repair garage in Williamsburg, Pennsylvania. He catered to both blacks and whites in his small community. One night in 1949, he was walking to a bar to meet a friend and was jumped from behind and stabbed several times in the back. Then the guy pulled Dave's father up by his shoulder and looked him in the face. Damn, said the black man who had jumped him. I got the wrong man. Some other men came along and Dave's father was taken to a hospital which saved his life. The wounds included a punctured lung and kidney. After a long recovery, Dave's dad reopened his auto repair garage. Then he noticed that his nine-year-old son was no longer friendly to his black friends. So one evening, Dave's father took Dave to the local black beer joint. The black men in the bar cheered as they walked in. He had had many well-wishers as he downed several beers. Then Dave's dad said to the son, these people are my friends, Dave, and I see that you're having bad thoughts about them. Don't let your judgment of one man be the judgment of all. This story rocked me to my core. All the times I had been with Dave since 1965, working, sailing, and hanging out, he had never mentioned this part of his life. All I knew that he was not prejudiced against blacks or anyone else for that matter. I have always considered Dave a very good friend. Now I know another part of the reason why. In 2012, I was still the only black person working in my government department. The white people did, want, did not want me there. And when they hired anyone new, always white, they would warn them to avoid me, saying that I was unpleasant and poor at my job. A couple of them told me so, told me so I knew what was going on. <clears throat> I did take it up with EEOC, but they just interviewed all the same white people who tell them I am the problem. My few supporters are not believed. In 1962, I became aware of racism. I was 11 years old. My grandfather had sent his chauffeur to pick me up from school and travel to Palm Beach, Florida. I was sitting up front next to the chauffeur and then we were pulled over by Georgia, in Georgia by the police. The driver was African American and the policeman pulled him out of the car, demanded his ID and roughed him up, all because he was sitting next to a young white girl in 1962. The man was a Baptist preacher employed by my grandfather. I was very scared and did not understand what was going on. This was my first experience <coughs> with racism. I became very active in many causes in the late 60s. I also took many <coughs> classes on racism in college. I will always remember my friend from the 1962 incident. <coughs> we were able to keep in touch until he passed away in the 1980s. <coughs> There's something that happened to me that has stuck with me for my whole life. And I'm 66 years old now. I was in second grade in Cleveland, Ohio, and I had a real admiration for nurses. With their blue capes and white hats, they looked like superheroes to me. 
One day in school, my teacher went around the room asking what each of us kids wanted to be when we grew up. When she got to me, I was all excited to tell everyone that I wanted to be a nurse. She said, your kind can't be a nurse. Your kind cleans up in the hospital. I think that experience stagnated me. I didn't become a nurse until my late 30s. And even though I am a retired nurse now, that story still has stuck with me. They have black friends, so that means they are not or can't be prejudiced. One of their best friends is black. Their son has black friends that are welcomed into their home. By the way, the home that someone in the family history bought to eliminate any black people from moving in. You know, if there's any truth to rolling over their graves, they are. <laughs> My Friday evening of happy hour socializing with them is only out of courtesy to my significant other. The feeling of being on edge because one never knows if defending myself or my culture will be necessary. Tonight you may have experienced recognition, discomfort, insights, compassion. We have two. Ruth King says, when sharing stories, it is helpful to know our racial inheritance and history. For example, what unfinished business did you inherit from your parents or ancestors? What racial stories need to be aired, honored, or even questioned? Storytelling is a healing art form, and we all have many stories to tell and many to listen and open to. May I work with my thoughts, fears, and beliefs in ways that nurture the dignity of all races. May we embrace our membership in each other's lives to discover our wholeness. May I welcome discomfort as a wake-up call to transform my heart and heal the heart of the world. Thank you for being with us. your eyes for a moment. We just put so many words into your ears and into your bodies. And it'd be meaningful to me and hopefully to all of us to just feel how these stories have landed in you and notice any images, any actual specific words that have stayed with you. There are several words that we ended our closing benediction with, that of recognition, discomfort, insights, and compassion. If you would uh, be willing to just very loudly say any single words, I'd love to just popcorn that around the room so that we could hear from you. I'm going to put on my glasses so I can see. <laughs> Change. 
Shame. 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 Guilt. Guilt. Disbelief. Disbelief. Ignorance. Ignorance. Anger. 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 Pain. Pain. Honesty. Honesty. You're kind. You're kind. Reality. 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 Sadness. Sadness. Open heartedness. Open heartedness. Awe. Awe. Bravery for the stories. Bravery with the stories. Hope. Hope. Passion. Passion. Compassion. Compassion. With passion. All right. Thank you so much for being here. My hope would be that this uh, caused you to think of stories that you're ready to go home and write tonight. <laughs> um, we have books for sale in the back for $5 that are the stories, plus a couple more that we didn't say out loud tonight that people submitted. Um, and on the back of these is the email where I take the, the submissions. So I do know where they came from, but we keep it anonymous other than that. And if you want to send submissions now, you could be part of the fifth annual racial monologues. All right, thank you. Are you Kay, you're gonna go back and sell. And do we have any books left from last year? Or those no. one? There's one book <laughs> left from last year, and otherwise the rest are from this year. Thank you so much for coming out tonight and sharing this journey with us. Thank you.